let, first of all, what will this talk be about? It's about clean code. So if you've read the clean code book, uh, part of the information is, for, is from there, but I have some interesting additions to it. It'll be fun, um, but it won't be breaking news discovered uh, yesterday evening. It's, it's classic stuff in a, in a funny and interesting, I hope, manner. So, first of all, they've told me not to move, so I, 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 from here to here, I'll try. Okay, uh, what we'll do? First of all, some motivational stuff. Why do we need clean code? Then the names and basically the power that you've been given to put names to the things that you create. Then about the same responsibility principle, arguably one of the core, the essential uh, principles of programming. Then about the OOP utopia. Then about incompetence. And then about some clean lambdas. How can you write clean code with Java 8? Interesting, with, really, uh, with real live coding if we have time. So, who am I? Uh, I'm a consultant, technical lead, one of the lead architects for the largest client of IBM Romania. But if I were to define myself in terms of what I want to do, I would name myself clean code evangelist. I'm really passionate slash maniac about clean code, and I talked about that in all sorts of conferences. And I'm really glad that you find clean code interesting still. I'm really glad to, uh, to see you so many here. In my spare time, what I like to do most is train as an independent training with various companies on topics like Spring, Java Enterprise, Clean Code, architecture, even design patterns in faculty, coding dojo, performance, and many other stuff. Okay, enough about me. What is Clean Code? Clean Code does one thing well, and we can already see the single responsibility principle right in here, right? This, this is said by the inventor of C++, right? Clean Code reads like well-written prose, like a book. Clean code was written by someone who cared, who put his best effort, his soul, into writing good, clean, elegant, beautiful code. Clean code is when each method you read turns out to be pretty much what you've already expected from the context where that method was. was. Martin Farrer comes and says that anyone can write code that a computer can understand, right? That, but very few programmers are able to write code that humans can understand. We no longer code in our caves. We communicate to other developers, right? So communicate, don't code. Before we go even further, I need to define what is the unit of measuring for clean code. Who knows it? What is the unit of measuring? I, I didn't say that, right? But I, <laughs> per minute. Right. You record how many times the team is being annoyed by the code, and there you go. That's a good measuring of how um, uh, the clean the code is. Uh, this is also a, 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 an aspect of the principle of least astonishment. The code that you read shouldn't shock you at every step. Shouldn't, shouldn't, wow, what's that? Wow, look at that. No, the code should turn out to be what you've already expected. Why do we need clean code? Because as many of you know, the true cost of software it, it relies on its maintenance, right? 80% of the money goes there in evolution, bug fixes, and so on. Why so much? Because we get slower and slower as time passes by. If we do one task now in one hour, in one week it will take us half a day, in one year it will take us three days, and in four years it will become impossible, right? Why? Because the code degrades if no one keeps it alive. You may not be concerned of this, of this financial consideration, but the thing that you read code 10 times more than you get to write it should tell you something, should make you write code as beautiful as possible, even if it makes writing code very, very difficult. One simple rule that you can apply starting tomorrow is the Boy Scout rule. Whenever you check out code from Git to do some evolution, some change request, some bug fix, when you put it back to, the, to Git, do some random acts of kindness, a little cleaning of the code, renaming variable, extract the method, basic stuff, save, stu save stuff with your IDE that can keep your code alive. Otherwise, you will come to work in such a place. Right. And yeah, I'm at work, let's write, Let, let's write code, right? In a place dominated by fear. It's even like fear equals legacy. And you could put it in the calendar. The day in which you stopped refactoring, it is the day in which your code base be became legacy. Congratulations, let's drink to that. So don't fear to refactor. If it's hard and it's risky now, tomorrow it will be even harder. So refactor as whenever you think you found uh, an idea. Now, with great power comes great responsibility, right? The thing is, many of us are drawn to programming by this act of pure creation. You sit relaxed one day, and the next day you 
write those things that you just invented in code, you put them names, you run them, and they are alive. There is a lot of, of, of responsibility to put names to the things that you create. That is, you need to be good at putting names. Don't name your functions like that. You wouldn't tell what this function does. What does it do? Search, find, get, persist. What does it do? So it's for a minimum verbs, basic stuff, right? Boolean stuff should be named as such that leaves no doubt. You can't possibly answer to these questions by saying green, right? It's, it's absurd. Just by the very name, you are pretty sure there's a Boolean in there. Okay, basic stuff. Nouns, of course, uh, class names are nouns, of course, but when you select names for your classes, try to avoid these boilerplate, useless, brainless, stupid um, prefixes. What's the difference between order info and order just by looking at the names of the classes? What's the difference? The, it has fields, right? And you can't possibly distinguish those. Maybe you should, should have said order details or full order versus brief order or something to express more. It's like not using the, your power that you've been given there, you know? Just get rid of the responsibility. In the same spirit, whenever you encounter a thing named I customer service, what is this? Tell me. It's it's an interface. I should, I should point this. You know? What is it? It's an interface, right? And it has one implementation, right? Named how? Named customer service, right? Perfect. And that's the, yeah, the IMPL is there, it will follow. These are useless, stupid prefixes that you put. In short, delete your interfaces. You have only three valid excuses to, to, to write interfaces. One is to package that interface in a jar and send it to your Java client for remote invocations. It's obviously the interface there. Other is the, the actual polymorphism is when you use strategy pattern to actually select your implementation at runtime based on some data. So the real strategy pattern. And the other one is dependency inversion, which allows you to implement that interface in a lower level module. But that's another story. It has to do with onions. Anyway, how do you understand the function? Tell me, probably you will read the comment, right? It has a comment, probably. Uh, maybe, maybe it didn't have. Then you will go hunt all the places where that function is being called, right? And you will invoke it just the same, maybe a little different, right? Call it just the same. The most warriors of us will open the function and read, re understand, reverse engineering the function to, to understand what the heck was going on there. You shouldn't need to do that. The name of the function should tell everything about it. Now, it's super hard to find a good name. And at times, you have this thought, I think I found a better name, but then it occurs to you, oh my god, it's impossible. I couldn't possibly have found a better name that was put there 15 years ago by the team that originally created this product in that apartment, right? So no, uh, it's stupid thought because you learn. By now, I think you realize that you aren't paid to write code. You are paid to learn, to understand the world of business and come up to a solution which fulfills their needs. So it is the most stupid thing to consider that they were smarter than you. No, you learn the application as you go, as you implement. So go ahead and rename it. It takes seconds with IDE. And it fails only in places like reflection, XMLs, but you will learn those places and you will take care next time. But don't be afraid to refactor. Never be afraid to refactor. Even in the delivery day, don't be afraid. It even has a name, this thing of, of clarifying the code after you've understood it. It's named comprehension refactoring, yeah, right? To explain the code to the future you. Rename it, rename it as a learn the application because there are no perfect names. You may, you probably know this quote, right? There are only two things hard in programming. First is, come on, come on, what was the, what? Ah, caching validation, come on, distributed caching, invalid threshing, la la la. And the second is naming things. Here we are, naming things. Cool. Now, your hope, and, and, one, and off by one error, right? <laughs> the team will be grateful. Now, one important thing, I have a question. Why would I think about this thing when there are other stuff in the Where we have the IDE besides you. Then you should take care about that. Those APIs, you should modify like that, of course, of course. Okay, now, um, I'm talking about business logic. You'll understand in a second. The thing is, uh, one um, uh, sin that we all uh, suffer from is pride. It is even the, the capital sin in our talks. The idea is this sin has been stimulated in faculty with homeworks, with assignments. We are all in our caves coding. 
And in our cave, we have the best of the best, right? But then we come to work, and we have to work in teams with a human. Oh, my God, it's a human there next to me. How do I work with him? No? And there's this fight of pride. If you want to get rid of your pride, review your own code three months ago. Three months ago. How many of you have cursed, have spoken bad words about the code, and then realized they were the author of that code? Why? Why did that happen? Why? First of all, probably you didn't review enough that code back then. But most importantly, we forget the design that we put there. After a weekend of beer, uh, of after, after a weekend, we, we don't see very clearly the design from Friday, so we forget things. So yourself will be grateful. I'm talking about a continuous refactoring just like a distillery. Just like refining good, good names, right? Names should be pronounceable, of course. You shouldn't be talking about such a function, right? You want n nice name. You, read, you, you are writing a book, remember that. So you should avoid abbreviations. Uh, um, avoid introducing new abbreviations, but don't be smart and write value-added text. Come on, it's uh, TVA, VAT, don't do that. It's a classic term from business. You should take it in your, in your, in your, in your code. But don't introduce new abbreviations. Names should be, how do you go to database? With find, with fetch, with go, or load, hide, hydrate, what do you do? Whatever you do, establish some naming conventions. In my project, get will throw an exception, nothing is there, whereas find will throw me, a, will get me a null. Whatever you do, establish some convention and make sure everyone in the team follows those conventions. In the same spirit, don't be overly creative. Don't refer to the same concept using buyer, client, or customer. It will confuse the reader. It will start thinking, why is there a buyer and then a client? Is there a difference? No, there is no difference. The author was just being creative. He should have written poetry, but not code. So stick to the, to the don't leave any doubts in your code. Now, you know this gap, right? On one side, there's the business with the money, and on the other side, it's us with the bytes. And we need to exchange the binary file with the money. So in order to be able to do that, for a minimum, we need to establish some language, some common language. We need to learn from their world, and we need to explain them our limitations, that we cannot have two submit buttons on the same web page, for Christ's sake. So explain them these things, right? Okay, now, about single responsibility principle. A function should do one thing, should do it well, should do it only. For that purpose, a function should be small. Small, 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 small. How small? Does any of you know how small a function should be? 100 lines. 5. <laughs> Read the, bi uh, the Bible, the clean code book. 5 lines. Why the heck 5 lines? How many things can you possibly do in 5 lines? You do a try catch, and you are left with 2 lines. What would you do in those two lines? You will, you will call other functions, right? Just call other functions, perfect. Now, the thing is, I think you can find, whoa, this call. I think you can find a better name. Now I cannot see you anymore, but you are there, okay. I think you can find a name that said what you did in the five lines of code. I think you can do that, right? Now, I realize that in our enterprise applications, there is this monkey work that we do from time to time, get set, get set. You know, that code boilerplate? This doesn't need to be factored in five lines of code, no. One IDE screen. But I don't mean you should rotate your monitor, right? So don't do that. Just, uh, the point is, my heuristic is that I cannot, if I cannot understand the function in three seconds, I split it in two. It's just a heuristic, just doesn't, be, doesn't need to be taken by the book five. If you don't do that, however, you will end up with such a function, like I did some years ago. And I was very happy about this function. I knew it by heart. I knew all its shapes. It was far. But the point is, for me, it was very convenient. It was like walking a, a known landscape, but for any other from the team, it was like wilderness, right? What would you do if you would have to change this method? You will start reading from line one, right? And read, 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 read. And then, what was that? Lunch break. You know, the pyramid, you need to eat. Let's go, get some food. Then we return. And then we continue. And then you found it. Aha, there's the place where I should do something different. What, what do you do now? What do you do now? Tell me. It starts to function, but no. Uh, what do you do, really? Put a nymph, you put a nymph, right? <laughs> you put a nymph, and then there above we say boolean, and you make everyone pass a false, whereas you will, will, will give a true, yes. 
that, that complete nonsense. It's like walking next to a garbage full of, uh, to a bin full of garbage with a tissue, with a dirty tissue in your hand. What do you do? You throw it there. It's already far. It's just like adding one more responsibility to the same pile of <laughs> responsibility. You should have sp split the method, of course, in, in multiple, multiple methods. Tell me one thing. How many methods do you think I got when I refactor this one? 25, 25 methods, and I was scared. I was terrified. Why do you think I was terrified? And please don't tell me performance, because smaller methods actually do run faster because of the eh, because of the f uh, they got hot faster. They get compiled to native code faster. So about performance, there is only one slide to show. There is only one only rule, one single rule to follow, measure, don't guess. Never, never imagine you know how fast GVM does things until you've read a couple of books. Don't measure the problem. See that it takes 15 minutes, optimize. You now have 14 minutes, revert. Optimize again, you now have three minutes, okay. So measure and then optimize, never, because, you know, Knut, this one with the impossible name, all that he did in his life was optimizing algorithms. And this guy said, premature optimization is the root of all evil. So who are we to say otherwise? Now, so this doesn't scare me now, but I was terrified by the fact that I had, instead of one familiar landscape, I had 25 methods. I didn't even recall their names, for Christ's sake. 25 names to remember, it's impossible, right? For me, it was a lot harder to work with, but the entire team was happier. Why? Because now he, they were oriented by function like, let me read this out loud, remove all past canceled orders of consumer. With all due respect, if you cannot understand what this function does, I don't want to work with you. This is how your code should look, right? Brain dead simple, brain dead simple. Now, let's talk about single responsibility. How many things do you think this function can do? Four. Usually it turns out to be three. So if you split it into, into different methods without any booleans, it will end up in three usually. This is a clear sign, not of laziness, but usually of fear plus rush, strict deadlines. Anyway, it is the perfect candidate to start refactoring with. Why? There are two things there. First, people are terrified by that function, are scared. Right? And secondly, this function was recently changed, was ev evolved. So it's bad code that evolves. It is the perfect candidate to start refactoring with. So you won't refactor a horrible function that never changed 10 years. Don't do that. Refactor the code which evolves, which changes, which annoys people. Right? In the same spirit, if the customer could have been null, what would you do in that function? You will check for null, right? You are good developers. We hate null pointers, right? I would say no, don't do that. Don't check for null. Never accept nullable parameters. What am I saying here? What am I saying? No null parameters. What about names of five, no, 600 characters? The longest name in the world is of an Indian, 600 characters. Or uh, profile photos of four, four gigabytes or negative ages. Or where do you check those things? It's time to, check, to talk about null wars. Where do you fight with invalid data? Suppose you could build a fortress, right? And inside the fortress, you could put some code in a peaceful zen. I would prefer to put inside the business logic of my application, those use cases that make my application unique, that justify the budget that I was given. This specification, the thing that really has to do the application. Outside is the enemy, in front with the user, of course. Uh, all the sources of possible, uh, possible uh, invalid data. And at the, at the entry point, I put a bodyguard that does a thoroughly body check, full body check of any kind of data that wants to enter my application. But if I validate all the data at the entry point, I can gain a sense of trust afterwards. Right? I can gain, uh, the data is, no, is, oh, is surely valid. It, it, it certainly is valid inside the fortress. Interesting, but from time to time, a null may occur inside your fortress. What do you do with it? First of all, in case this null has a valid business reason, for example, a customer without a gold card, the best thing you could do is to use optional. Do you know about optional? It is the best, the best underused feature of Java 8. 
use optional, which can get you rid of, of null pointer exceptions. But in case the null represents an invalid condition, don't be scared of throwing an exception. Uh, this is how we get to exceptions in the war that once was between checked and unchecked. The war is over, folks. The war is over. We are now using just runtime. Why? Not to be forced to write code like this. You know, catch exception swallow. Don't do that ever, 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 ever. We love runtime exceptions because we don't see them. We throw them and we are sure by some global exception handler that they are logged correctly in the log. So no problem with that. If you want some, some intelligent message for your user, put an enum inside and translate it at the boundaries. And in case, if you do that, you are left only with a handful of catches in your domain logic. Those catches which, which signify recoverable errors. And there are very few of them. Connection timeout exception that you can retry three times. Very few of them. So get rid of catches, in, in short. There's a whole lot of principles and guidelines to follow. No one, not even Uncle Bob, can write a function like that from scratch. No one. The only way to write that is by continuous refactoring, continuously reviewing, refactoring your code. So the point is you are not done when your code first starts working. And I, I look at my junior developers, what they do when they finish the use case. You know? If always they get up and run, take a break, then th for the next project they won't be with me. But if I see them standing and thinking, hmm, let's change a bit, three minutes, five minutes work of a little refactoring, renaming this and that. So do refactor at that moment when you finished the use case, when you see it works. Quick example, how can you simplify this function? And let me, let me take my, my, my opinion. If strings different than null, when the reader get, uh, gets past this line, he gets tired, he gets stressed, because an else will follow, right? And he has to remember that. And he keeps reading, then he enters a four, then the if then I try, then I catch, you know. And then he reaches the actual business logic, but he's all sweated, and oh my God, don't do that to your reader. How can you refactor this one? Come on, like, what can you do? You can invert this, like invert this, and you quickly return if something is not right, you see? So if you do that simple trick, now you can count only one consecutive tab in your function, you see? Right before there were two tabs here, with, look, one, two. Now there's, there's just one. Interesting enough, this is a good measure of function complexity, the number of consecutive tabs. And I even worked for a client who wrote a Maven plugin, which if it detected three tabs in a, in a file, would crash the build. <laughs> Perfect. You can't possibly write a horrible function without, without typing four tabs, right? Now, that's mo the most simple refactor we can do. Now, let's see the most complex refactor. How can you refactor a function of 1,000 lines? 1,000 lines. Quick hint, a class should, n should have no more than 300 lines. How can you refactor a function that has 1,000 lines? Folks, that's not a function. That's a, that's a class. So you make it a class. You make it a class. And this is the bazooka we have in our, in our arsenal. <laughs> let, let's, take it, let's, let's clarify this. IntelliJ does it automatically for you, but let me just show you how, how this is done. The parameters which were taken by the function, ah, the point is, if you try to extract this little block here, you might need to pass this new function 10 parameters. At some point, you might need to, uh, it may even be impossible in case you change from this block to local variables, as Java doesn't have multiple returns, it would be impossible. Right? So then what do you do? You create a class. You take the parameters through the constructor. The local variables now become fields in the new class. And then the rest of the logic we have moved to the method named execute, for example, from, starting from which you can extract little blocks. And these blocks will already have fields accessible to them. You will not need to pass them 10 parameters, right? So this becomes possible. It's, it's hard. It's a hard refactoring. It's the most hard refactoring. Now, at the left side, you invoke a function. At the right side, you instantiate a class, and then you execute, and then you throw away the instance, you see? It's a it's difference of, 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 of perception. Now, if I, if I were to ask you one of the most difficult questions, uh, the class, is it stateful or stateless? Stateless. State? Stateful, stateful, because it contains intermediary results of the same computation. It's, it represents, it is one instance per invocation. If there were two, two users running on the same instance, 
it will crash, race conditions. So this is a stateful class. A stateful is bad. Is there any functional programming maniac in the room? Yeah, state is bad, right? State is bad. You don't want state. You don't want variables. I hate variables. But okay, let's see. Sorry? Only mutable state? Only mutable state is bad, indeed. You have to have state, but not mutable. Perfect, 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 perfect indeed. Now, let's talk about uh, uh, um, this utopia that we were taught of, struct. Do you remember struct from C? Type def struct and la, la, la? It was, it was lovely, it was just data, no, really. Some folks put pointers to functions, but the point is it was just data there, right? Data. Perfect. We can do structs in Java. This is one particularly tasty example, which is immutable. Uh, by uh, speaking of, of mutable state, it has only final fields. Perfect. It's thread safe. It can be put in hash sets. It's, it's perfect. And if you create an instance correctly, it will remain correct for its entire life. Perfect. There is yet another more ugly example of, uh, of a structure, which is this. You know it, right? It has private fields and public getters and setters. If we are doing OOP, right? We are encapsulating stuff. Wrong. This is not encapsulation. This is no different than having public fields. Like I do in my application, I have public fields for my JSON structures that go out. So don't be afraid about public fields. You were lied in high school about polymorphisms. This is not encapsulation. This is... <laughs> so let's talk about OOP in one slide if you will allow me. Uh, OOP means exposing behavior, not state. Uh, don't do that, and don't do that either. Do that, start engine. If you do that, in the next version, you can switch to having three states for your engine, not just two of them, right? So hide your state. Then hide, if you really have to tell something to your user, tell as little as possible. Don't do that, do even less, tell, tell him even less, tell only that how, much percentage of fuel you are left with. Or even go and tell him, get estimated remaining kilometers. Because if you do that, in the next version of the car, you can switch to a hybrid car on battery, right? It won't, the API won't change. So OOP is all about the allowing implementation to evolve without breaking your existing client. Cool, super cool. But at work, we don't do OOP, right? Despite the interview. <laughs> Why? Why? Why do you write procedural code in your enterprise applications? By the way, it's time to say that I come from an enterprise application environment, IBM, you can figure it out. So the point is there are applications which don't follow all these, these ideas, but in our enterprise applications, we, we translate existing business processes into software. And it's super natural to map procedures to procedural code. Pascal. Procedural code. Then. We are left with lots and lots of procedural code, right? Huge amount of, of, of logic. How do you structure it? How do you follow the most important principle in enterprise development? Keep things simple, extreme programming. Keep it things as simple as possible for as long as possible. How can we organize this huge amount of code to keep it simple and understandable? We do that by using classes as containers of logic. We distribute this huge amount of functions into many classes. And we, we use classes as bare containers of data. Not objects, not, not structures, right? G imagine user service or user repository. This isn't an object, this isn't a structure. It's a container of logic, of procedural code. Whoa, so should we be sad? Should we, we be frustrated? I mean, we really, we never do OOP? Come on, it's impossible. Actually, this thing of defending your users from future changes in your implementation applies only when you're writing mini frameworks or, 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 or other kind of reusable code. If you ever create mycorp-commons-1.0, you see the 1.0 is in flames here? This is my problem, basically, because tomorrow I'll find the bug and I'll want all the applications to migrate to 1.1. But, the, but if, as soon as they change from 1.0 to 1.1, their, their code crashes in flames, they will not migrate. And my bug will go to production. And I will be charged from my salary. Right? So love your, protect your clients. Protect the application that uses this library by doing OOP there, by protecting them for your implementation. Ooh, let's talk about formatting. Do you see the sunglasses in this bit of code? Hmm. Do you see it now, perhaps? Let me help you more. Neo, but at work, 
It's not metrics, folks. It's teamwork. You are not the chosen ones. You are working in teams. So realize that you, we are working with other humans, with, 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 with humans, right? So don't code with using your, don't encrypt your code. Communicate about it. Cool. Now, the thing is, you should respect always your readers. Right? Remember, you will read that code. If you, write, if you wrote your code 10 minutes, someone will stare at your code for almost two hours. And you don't want to know his thoughts about you. <laughs> write literature. Never obfuscate. There is no excuse for obfuscating your code just to be smart. Never. It is the most awful mistake you can do. Write children literature. If in one day you have energy, Write a text, write a good, a clean, dry, fast, non-overlapping, significant unit test. It is the most complex thing any developer, no matter how senior, can do. So write a test, don't complicate your code. Know that bit of IDE that you're using, know those shortcuts, do context among you with the mouse put there. Let's refactor. The first who finishes gets the beer. Do that without, without the mouse. Learn those shortcuts. You should move as fast as possible with your IDE. Use IntelliJ. Um, <laughs> static import. Static import. I don't. Really. I, it's my problem. I know it's a problem. Um, static imports. Tune them. Default call blacks. Tune them. Ensure that once you've changed a bit of code, you can deploy in a matter of seconds on your local environment. Do as much as possible to shorten the loop, to move as fast as possible. Some hints. A line should never exceed 120, 140, because there are still among us who code in the airplane, in the newborn position with your laptop in your lap, you know? Laptop, it's on my lap, and I'm coding. And I want to hunt down the horizontal scroll bar, you know? Hunting down the horizontal scroll bar, click, drag, it's, it's lovely. Don't do that to your readers, right? Methods should be five, ten lines long, not more than one screen. And files in itself, not more than 200 lines. If you use characters or tabs, if you use the Egyptian style, if you use spaces, how do you form it? doesn't matter. The only, the only thing that matters is that you know, the entire team follows the same rule. That is, if I would go to a team who puts the brackets here, who the heck puts brackets there? Anyway, if I would go to such a team, I would put the brackets in the same place. No problem. I will, I will have some time, some hard time myself, but follow the rules, the style of the existing code. My favorite slide. Comments are a written proof or in, of your incompetence. Are a clear statement that you are not a good programmer. Why? You wrote some, some code. You knew you did an awful job. You know, you know. Your conscience tells you you did a mess. So what do you do? You put a comment, <laughs> and you're cool, and you go grab a beer. Don't do that. Don't ever do that. Try to express that thing in your code. Because the comments end up lying to us. Lying to us. Because statistically, 15 to 25% de uh, of developers, of good developers, always take care to update the comments whenever they update the implementation. So in five years long, your comments will tell an old story, will lie to you in the face. That's even why in IntelliJ and Eclipse, the comments are grayed out, washed away colors, not to disturb our eyes. Because everyone knows that the only truth is not the specification, not the documentation, it is the live running code in production. So don't put their comments that will lie in two years from now. Try to express it in code. For example, okay, the list one, okay, the list, who the heck, x, okay, interray, okay, but x of zero equals four, it's the most outrageous thing. It is, con you should put them, there are magic numbers, you should put explanatory constant there, of course. Then you could introduce useless variables. You can, if you look carefully, the variable is flagged exists only for one, for two lines, you see? It's flagged, it's very, just defined and then used and that's it. I introduced that variable just to put a name to this calculus. Now imagine you have those patterns, if, la 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 la, and, enter, la la la, or, la la, you know? That, a big if, we love it, no? with, multi, with many, many parentheses. What do I do always? I take blocks out of there, I extract local variables at the, in front of the if, and then in, in one line, I combine all the variables together. Don't force your reader to click on the parentheses to see where it ends. Don't do that, right? 
Then we will introduce even useless methods that don't do more than just this comparison here. I'm just doing this comparison here in a separate function. This is named the encapsulate conditionals. And it's super useful in case you're using Java 8, right, with filter, super useful. And then split your methods, of course. Now, this is how you want to document your code, not with some lazy comments that, that, that uh, get out of date very soon. Typical example of bad comments, this awful example. Um, first, it conveys the frustration of the author. That's something that you must never do. By just reading that comment, you feel anxious, right? You feel bad. Why? Why the heck? No, never. This guy needed professional assistance. But furthermore, I'm terrified by the thought that he might have forgotten to put a to-do there. That's the thing that terrifies me. Maybe it's a forgotten to do, you know? So as a minimum, put a to-do when you have. This is lovely. This is the, this is matrix. This is the victory of machines over humans. <laughs> this is sonar at his best, right? Don't do that. Don't ever do that. Tune, tune that sonar. This is a clear sign that your class is way too long, right? You should split it. Comment that code should not be read, not understood, nothing. Just delete it on spot. Now, if you ever want to put a comment, put it on the same line. Never on the method or on the class or God knows where. No, or, or in packageinfo.java. Don't do that. Put it on the line. Now, um, don't describe to me in a comment what abstract factory design pattern is, please. Put a link, if you have energy, go write a test, right? Don't, 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 don't be smart in your comments. No one will ever read them anyway. So don't do that, right? It just obfuscates the real code. Now, there are times when you, you can possibly tell in code that you want to use Jigstra algorithm for navigating an oriented graph, or you work around a known bug. What do you do there? You put a link to a new era, to a Jira page or a wiki page, and there, there you go, that's it. If you have to pass minus seven as the first parameter of a strange API, explain to the reader, don't be mad, I know how you feel, it just it's, that's what it needs, minus seven. Right? If you don't know who will maintain your code, make sure they know that you should never use the same simple format in multiple threads. That is, don't put it on a field in a thing that I'll never, like I did 10 years ago. Don't do that, right? It's not thread safe. To do is followed by the name. If you, write a, if you ever write a Java uh, a library, you would want to do your best to keep your, your clients at the API level. You don't want them digging in your implementation, right? You want to keep them on the API level, so then you document that API as best as you can. Uh, take notice of how the Java doc for Spring looks like, right? The public API is well documented. Legal stuff, okay. Now, about lambdas. How do you handle a a lightsaber, right? Why do we love lambdas? They're cool, right? They literally caused a clear increase in the popularity of Java when they were launched, when they were added to the language. Now, this can, the, my consideration, since I'm a clean code maniac, uh, is the code cleaner with Java 8 or not? For, the, for example, this is expressive, I agree, it's super expressive, but it can become even cryptic, and you know that you can do awful stuff with, 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 uh, with strings. For that purpose, I even organized a little study of my own, and I will briefly tell you the conclusions. Now, first of all, whenever you start a lambda, never break line. Never break, so lambdas are good. Don't use them. I mean, um, use them just one-liners. I will tell you more. I will do a live coding in a moment. Then, uh, if, you f if you have 10, dot filter, dot flat map, dot group by, dot collect, dot stream, dot filter, dot map, in one single block like that, you will kill your reader. They will begin to cry. I, I saw them. I really show such a code to someone more, more junior. He will actually, I didn't cry, but his eyes will fill, you know what I mean? <laughs> then encapsulate predicates, I will show you in a moment. Master any map, master flat map. Okay, let's take this bit of example, this bit of code, and try to refactor it. And you will, you will um, excuse the, the fact that I use Eclipse, first of all, and then um, um, try to play with me a bit. So you have this lovely filter condition, right? Lovely. It's a lambda which spans more than one line. It's a mistake. So first of all, I noticed that it's a filter which spans two conditions, you see? So the first thing that I can do is to break it into two successive filters. You see? Like this. By the way, do you see my screen? Oh, okay. 
good. Then um, I can look down a bit and I can fit this bit of code. What can I do about that? I can create, I can encapsulate conditional, as it's called. So it means the following stuff. Get this Boolean test out of here and name it is not in stock. Uh, if we pretend that we're in a real application, we're actually creating a Boolean in an entity, a Boolean returning function in an entity that will return to us something like that. Right? Never call your own getters, come on. Okay, so if you do that, then you can use what? Four dots. We love four dots. It's so cool. Okay, and it fits one line, perfect. But we can do even better. Let's, let's see. Order dot, order, order line stream, perfect. So we are in a stream, and we're, we're opening another stream. <laughs> Don't do that to your reader. Extract this little bit of block. How, how can you name this new method? L let's look together. So order line stream, any match is not in stock. I would argue that this can be named has order lines not in, what a name, right? Long names for your method, like this. And if you do that, you can do the, f uh, this can be simplified even further. Do you know how? I can, uh, this for that, exactly. And I do it super often. I, I extract some bit of functionality, either to map from one object to another, or some predicate like that, in a method in the same service, in the same class, that it, because it is use case specific, it doesn't have purpose in other place. And I refer it using this. I do it super often. Then, if I try to do the, the same thing here, I would uh, see that uh, this predicate actually uh, would require me to give the warning date besides the order to test. So this will not be able to use you using four dots, right? You cannot have a nice currying in Java. So what we can do instead is, in, is extract this, all this, as a predicate variable. Wow, cool. So, uh, <laughs> has delivery date before warning? It's a predicate, and there you go, the nightmare begins. This is a variable holding a function. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, but he, he suppose now that in, from other use cases, you want to use the same predicate. The same is useful in other use cases too. What can you do? You can extract a method named just the like with a method which, which, which returns a, oh, come on. A method which returns a predicate. And there you go, this is a higher order function. A function that returns another function and your world collapsed. I'm sure. Now, if I, then I can invoke this one. But you mind that thing, you are invoking a function to get a predicate. And I can make it a public. A public static, why not? And even I can put it in a different class. Order predicate. For example, just to play a bit, right? You can do this, and you can uh, now, if you extract this as a separate class, you can reference the same predicate factory, let's say, from another place in your application, right? I don't say you should do that tomorrow morning, but uh, I just wanted to show you how deep can you go with that. And if you do that, you have another advantage. You can do or, you can compose predicates together, and so on. So, um, how, where do you put the, your predicates, actually? First, you can put them in another method in the same class, in this, in case that functionality, that predicate, is not useful from other use cases. You can push it right in your entities or in your domain objects uh, as a synthetic getter, as an as a encapsulated conditional, or you can you work with predicates as local variables, or, you can, or even you can create, Christ, static factory methods for predicates. And again, your world collides. But uh, the thing is, you can go this deep by, uh, by using predicates. That's what I want to say here. Now, in Java 8, no, learn the entire API. But don't use it all from the first day. Don't do that to your teammates. I know you are geeky and you want to prove how tough you are. Don't do that. Remember, never obfuscate. Always make sure the entire team knows what you're, the heck you're writing there. Use name function. In short, you are never allowed to have this in your code. Uh, arrow, bracket, never. Whenever you have such a bit of code, extract it as a separate method and reference the method from this. Why? What are lambdas? Lambdas are anonymous function implementation. And that's my problem. They are anonymous. And I want names. I want nice names to tell my reader what's going on. 
So I always prefer to use four dots. Then use optional. And read about the method map, which can get you read of, of uh, null pointer exception. Whenever you do a dot get b dot get c get d get e, whatever null you have there will break in null pointer, correct? Now, if you're using map, you can map through such a train wreck without any null pointer exception. Read about that. Then cherish your predicates, right? Put them in all the nice places you can. And since you're learning a new, a new language, because Java 8 is a new language, uh, be sure to uh, request some review from your teammates, those with blue screen, I mean Facebook, uh, uh, come on, grab an eye, what, what do you think? Or buy you a rubber duck, right? the, the, the pattern, rubber duck programming, told to the duck, explain to the duck, look, here is, okay, the point is peer review is essential since you're learning a new language actually, and peer programming comes to the rescue, which is the best thing you can ever do. Okay, so, as key points. When you stop refactoring, you can put it in your calendar, right on the wall. Today, my application became a legacy. Never fear to refactor, never fear to refactor. It will be even harder tomorrow. Refine, continuously refine expressive names, right? Just like vodka. Refine, refine, refine. Function should be short methods, short little methods, right? Five lines, 10 lines, one screen, small, nice methods. Classes can be structs, objects, or logic containers. Don't pretend you're doing OOP in the place you're not. With formatting, realize that comments are failures. You are writing your resignation partially, right? I'm incompetent. <laughs> and then the comments begin, you know? <laughs> Write expressive code. Pair programming is the way to learn anything new, including a new language. Now, um, one typical question that I get, how the heck do I refactor my legacy code of one million lines of code? The only, th the only way to, ref to be able to refactor such a monster is to practice. Is to practice a lot, a lot, a lot. Do katas, do coding dojos, do pair programming four hours a day, do hackathons, do things that force you to refactor simple examples for them to be able to refactor the big monster, right? Just like in the Nintendo, right? You fight with small monsters and then come the, comes the boss. You know? The same idea. Little examples and then boof, the big one. Um, where can I read more? <laughs> uh, no programmer, no developer joining my team is allowed to write any line of code until he, has, he she has finished reading two thirds of this book. It is a mandatory book for me. Yes, it is a mandatory book for me for all the, it's the basic, the very basic thing that you must know. That's it, I'm done. If you have any kind of question, now or after, whenever you 